It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is John Fry, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, A Prairie Faith, The Religious Life of Laura Ingalls Wilder. John, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Well, John, this is the first time you and I are getting to meet on camera today. I know you're going to be absolutely brand new to my audience. So let's start this out by having you share a little bit of the John Fry origin story. Uh, Give us a little bit of context for background, education. What are a few things we should know about you? Sure. So uh, I was born in Pittsburgh and I grew up on a farm about an hour north of Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania. Um. I went to uh, Geneva College, which is a small Christian liberal arts college in Western Pennsylvania to get my ma- uh, bachelor's in history. Uh, I got a master's in history from Duquesne University, which is in Pittsburgh. Uh, and then I came out to the Midwest and got a PhD in American history from the University of Iowa. Uh, for the last 20 years, I've taught at Trinity Christian College, which is a, a reformed liberal arts college in the southern suburbs of Chicago. Uh, I've written two previous books. Uh, My first book was about farmers in the Midwest and what they were reading at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, My second book is called Almost Pioneers, and it's about a couple from Iowa who homesteaded in Wyoming during the 19-teens. And uh, my third book, uh, Prairie Faith, just came out last week. And uh, I'm curious, how did you stumble into doing an extensive amount of writing and research on Laura Ingalls Wilder. You share a little bit of that in the book, and it wasn't like you grew up reading these books, so I find it fun that you kind of fell into the space. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, growing up, it was my older brother and me, so there's mostly testosterone in the house. We did not uh, grow up uh, reading the Little House books, Uh, but my wife got me to read them shortly after we got married in the early 90s. And I was really taken with their really attractive portrait of family flourishing and the, the straightforward prose. And uh, at that point, I was actually in, in grad school at Duquesne University. Um, in Pittsburgh, most histor- his- history students were doing urban history or like labor history, and I wasn't really interested in that. And my wife said, why don't you do some writing about Laura Ingalls Wilder? And so I wrote several papers at Duquesne that got me into farm newspapers, which was my uh, my dissertation project at Iowa. Um, I then sort of did a, uh, a sideways movement to write about Laura Gibson Smith in, in Wyoming. And then when after that book came out, people started saying, you know, what do you want to write about next? And I said, I want to do something on Laura Ingalls Wilder. And for this latest book that just came out, uh, for, like I always like to hear like, what for you? What was the why? Why? Why did you need to explore this topic further? Because you talked about in the book, there were some other books that have tried to explore the faith life of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, why? Why was your contribution needed to this conversation? Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's other biographies that have addressed uh, her faith in you know in in the course of telling Laura Ingalls Wilder's life. Um, one of the best ones is by uh, a scholar named John Miller, who I actually got to know in the 90s. He's a good friend. And uh, he sort of argues that uh, Laura was a very committed Christian. Christianity was very central to her life and worldview. But as I read, uh, or as I read the Little House books, if you read the Little House books, not all the descriptions of the church in them are positive. Um, some of them have a real negative edge. And that got me wondering, what's the best way of explaining this? Um, The other layer in that is uh, that Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote uh, handwritten manuscripts of each of these books and then handed them off to her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, who typed them and edited them as uh, she went along. And uh, they together actually created the books that got published. And when they were writing them in the late 20s and early 30s, Rose was an agnostic. She had pretty much rejected uh, the organized church and Christianity, sort of had some cultural uh, pulls towards Islam. Actually, she had traveled to the Middle East. 
And I thought, what's really, what's the story? Who's writing what in, in these books? And I thought, uh, maybe I can contribute to that by trying to tease that out. And in terms of research, primary sources, uh, historical sites, museums, what was some of the ground you traversed, so to speak, uh, to get ready to write this book or in the midst of the writing process? Yep. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting. So Laura Ingalls Wilder's daughter, Rose, is a fascinating woman. She was a journalist and a writer in the early 20th century, ended up writing a biography of Herbert Hoover at one point, one of uh, Charles Lindbergh. Um, so her papers are actually all at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, which is in eastern Iowa. And as part of her papers is a bunch of correspondence between him, or, sorry, between her and, and and her mother, Laura Ingalls Wilder, as they were writing these books. Um, and some uh, typescript drafts of the, uh, of the Little House books and uh, some other materials from Laura. So I went there and that's where I sort of launched um, the project. I originally thought the project was going to be an article. Um, but after uh, presenting a paper at a conference in uh, in the fall of 2016, I had been working on this for eight years, um, I had uh, two publishers come up to me and say, hey, would, would you be interested in writing a full biography of Laura that pays particular attention to her faith? And I said, well, I guess I could think about that. And um, I, I think both publishers wanted to have uh, a book on Laura Ingalls Wilder, given her popularity and, you know, a continuing popularity. Um, ended up going with Erdmund. Um, I, I went, there's a, a small archives in Desmet, South Dakota, where uh, the Ingalls family lived, where Laura lived during her uh, adolescence and her early marriage. Uh, there's also uh, a collection down in Mansfield, Missouri, where uh, Laura and El Manzo lived most of their uh, adult lives. And then I did some research in the University of Missouri archives, uh, and uh, the University of Missouri has collections in Columbia, where the main University of Missouri is, also in Rolla and in St. Louis. And I went to those sites to look at their materials. One of the, gosh, I, there's so many places I want to go. Let me, I'm, I'm going to move around in my notes for my original plan. Uh, one of the things you tease out in the book is that it seems like Laura, in, in terms of some, a few of the things she said, that she was almost uncomfortable seeing or hearing other people share about their experiences with God. Um, can, can we say that that impacted her writing or is that more of an anecdotal comment that we see in a few places? Yeah. So, um, it, it comes up in one place. Uh, so before, uh, Laura and Rose actually started writing autobiographical children's fiction, which is what the little house books are. Uh, Laura sat down and wrote a memoir of her early life. And gave it to Rose. Their hope was that they could uh, get it published, maybe by a magazine who would serialize it. And uh, she called it uh, Pioneer Girl. Uh, they weren't able to get any publishers interested in it. And then they ended up taking material out of that memoir to, to write the Little House books. Um, the memoir itself was not published in its entirety until 2014. Actually came out in a large annotated edition. It's a beautiful book. Um, in that book, uh, Laura mentions that uh, she would go to prayer meeting and one of her friends, this is a male friend that she mentions in other parts, and would uh, testify at prayer meeting about sort of his spiritual life. And those things made her uncomfortable. And uh, she said the things between a person and God should be just that, between him and God, is, uh, is a comment. And I think that helps to explain why she really doesn't talk about Christianity an awful lot. Uh, in uh, in the Little House books and other things. But I don't think it means that she didn't have a deep faith herself um, and, uh, and it wasn't an important part of her life. And one of the things that was new to me was that Laura uh, wrote for the Missouri Ruralist. She was writing articles for the newspaper before she was stepping into writing her autobiographical stories uh, what was the sort of content she was contributing in that stage of her life? Yeah, the Missouri Ruralist uh, articles and columns are pretty fascinating. She started in early teens um, with sort of feature stories about some of her neighbors, actually, um, and what was going on on her own farm, her and Elmanzo's own farm, Rocky Ridge, uh, in south central Missouri. 
and uh, you know, talking about growing apples and uh, saving people, uh, saving women, especially farm women, time on the farm. Um, so there are feature articles. Then she became the editor of their women's department. Um, farm newspapers in the early 20th century uh, often have a women's department that would collect uh, material from other newspapers, other farm newspapers about labor-saving devices, about um, taking care of chickens and uh, other sort of female contributions to farm income. And uh, and Laura wrote, wrote some of those, but then she often just sort of did an advice column. It wasn't that she was answering people asking for advice, but talking about how she thought that farm women could live better on the farm uh, in different areas uh, and often sort of moral uh, engaging moral things about disagreements with neighbors and uh, and sometimes uh, addressing larger public issues. She wrote during World War I and addresses uh, some of the uh, challenges of uh, living during the war and also uh, fighting a war. Um, and, and then she also does talk about Christian ideas and Christianity itself at times. And let's now jump into maybe what we describe, what we would describe as some of the things we can know about Laura's spiritual life ba based on your research and the, and the writing you examined. Um, uh, first let's jump into her, kind of her, her younger pre-adult years. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, uh, the, the religious spiritual influence in her home that that does come across quite a bit in the books what what can we know for sure uh from what she shares from that part of her life sure so uh laura's family began attending a congregational church when the family moved to minnesota uh laura would have been around six years old uh before that they uh observed the sabbath in their home they didn't uh do things they didn't attend churches they weren't close enough to a church in either Wisconsin or Kansas, where they lived, uh, but they uh, uh, they read the Bible, they sang hymns. Uh, Laura's father played the violin when they sang all kinds of different things and hymns on Sundays. Um, but then uh, congregational churches in uh, in Minnesota, in Iowa, where they lived briefly, and then in uh, South Dakota, uh, certainly uh, Protestant morality uh, was taught in the house: obey your parents love your sister, uh, be kind to others. And um, some indications uh, that her parents and her older brother or older sister, Mary, uh, became members of the church in DeSmet, South Dakota, the congregational church. No evidence actually that Laura ever became a member. Um, but so there, but there are certainly commitments they attended weekly, um, uh, mainly Sunday school and morning worship services. There were, it was an evening service, but they didn't attend that. And in terms of habits, kind of spiritual practices, I mean, at, at one point, Laura's memorizing Bible verses to be competitive and kind of try to win a contest, prayer, Bible reading. What can we know about you know, habits, spiritual practices from that point of her life? Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, daily prayer, it sounds like, before they went to bed. Um, she uh, she did have this experience when she was 11 years old. and. Um, uh, so the, the family went to the congregational church in, in Walnut Grove, Minnesota, but she also went to the Methodist church in the afternoon, the Methodist, so the, the congregational church had its own building. The Methodists met in a meeting room above the, uh, the grocery store basically. And so she went to two worship services because the Methodist church was having a contest for young people to memorize two Bible verses a week. Um, and then recite them all at the end of the year. So basically learned 104 Bible verses. Um, Laura and one other person, actually it's the, the young man that she talks about in other places testifying, uh, were able to do that and uh, won a reference Bible as, a, as an, an award. Um, during that year, um, Laura's family was uh, close to poverty most of her upbringing. And uh, at times she had to work outside the home for money. And uh, at one point she was staying with a family whose the, the husband was often far from home, uh, was traveling. And so she stayed with the wife and kids. So she was away from her own house at age 11. Um, uh, 
many nights, many evenings. And she talks about saying her prayers and having an experience of the divine, basically, that she uh, felt a, uh, a comforting presence and thought that must be what people call God. And uh, so, you know, in, in her, and she, even though she was reticent to talk about it, she mentions that she didn't like people who talked about this. She remembered it for 50 years when she was writing her memoir. And so that comes into her memoir. Uh, both of those stories when she was writing it in 1929. And if we jump further ahead into her adult married life, uh, which the bulk of she was in Mansfield, Missouri, um, what can we know about her spiritual life practices in that uh, adult stage of her life? And it, it spans many decades. Yep. So most of her adult life, uh, they lived uh, in this farm close to Mansfield, Missouri. They moved there in 1894. Um, Almanzo died in 1949. Uh, Laura died in 1957. Uh, she was a couple days past her 90th birthday. Um, there was no congregational church in Mansfield, so they went to the Methodist church. Um, they attended the Methodist church. Uh, all of the evidence points to the fact that they never became members of the Methodist church. It's hard to exactly know what to do with that. Um, but uh, but they were committed. Um, and uh, I think Methodism for her was a way of sort of believing in what the Bible taught in the gospel, but there weren't as many particular beliefs uh, that might have been required. Uh, if she had gone to the Baptist church, there's a Baptist church in town. There's a Presbyterian church in town. She says uh, multiple times in different writings that she didn't uh, buy uh, predestination. Uh, that would have been sort of stock and trade for the Presbyterians there. And um, uh, pretty strict Sunday uh, observance for the Presbyterians as well. She went to the Methodist church. Um, I, although it's interesting. So one thing, one of the taglines, I guess, for the book is that uh, unlike John Miller, who saw Christianity is very central to her life, um, I see Christianity as important, but not actually central. There were her neighbors who were much more sort of committed to the church and its activities than Laura and Almanza were. Uh, in the book, you kind of talk about Laura has sort of two worlds, her literary world, the fictionalized versions of, of her stories, then kind of the actual uh, historical world uh, that she lived in, so to speak. Uh, in terms of you know, obviously Little House on the Prairie TV show books, just epically popular uh, for most of us when when we were growing up. Um, I would love to hear just in terms of questions you get asked when when you speak, or just you know, we we all have this. Most of us have a very popular level view of Laura and her life based on the fictional stories and uh, the TV show. What what are some of the thing the questions you get asked? The things that surprise people most. Because uh, we have a very Hollywoodized idea, I think, of who Laura is and what her life was like. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So in, in some ways, I sort of see three worlds, right? So there's the historical world of Laura Ingalls Wilder as she lived. And that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm a historian. Um, but we always have to reckon with these other two worlds, the world of the Little House books, as you read the Little House books, and then the world of the television series, which is a very different world, even from the um, the Little House books. Um, and and it's difficult because the Little House books they're really well written. The prose is incredibly inviting. It sort of describes uh, the psychological states of a young girl, and then and then she grows up over the course of the books. Um, and the last four books are really young adult fiction before young adult written before young adult fiction was really a thing. Um, and when you read those books, it sounds like that was just the way things happened. That was what happened to her when she was growing up. And it's always difficult to sort of, um, realize that those are fiction. Uh, Laura combined characters. She changed events. She left things out. She put things in that didn't happen. She and Rose collaborated on these together, and so Rose had an impact on uh, what was in the Little House books. When I first started doing sort of historical research, I really had, it was difficult for me to pull myself away from thinking, well, the Little House, book, Little House books say this, this must be how it happened. Um, 
And so I try to be kind uh, when I speak or when I talk to people who have read and love those little house books. Um, and well, it's not exactly um, how it happened. So I get, you know, so I get questions about uh, Jack the dog, who's a beloved character in uh, the little house books. It's actually the only character in the little house books who dies, whose death is described. Um, even though, even though the historical Laura, um, her parents had a, had a son who died in infancy. Um, but Laura doesn't write about him in the books. Um, Jack actually, uh, in the actual story of, so they, you know, of, of Laura Ingalls Wilder's life is traded along with some horses for some different horses early on and, and doesn't go into the fourth, <laughs> fourth sort of chapter of her life. Um, and so I have to say, yeah, well, um, didn't exactly happen that way. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I try not to kill people's dreams and things like that. I think there's a place for fiction that, um, engages us about what's possible. Um, and I think there are some historians who get angry at Laura Ingalls Wilder for sort of painting a past. that's not exactly the way things were. Um, I don't get angry at her. I think that, you know, there's fiction and then there's history. Um, let's try to tell the story, uh, about if you're writing history, tell the story as accurately as you can. Well, I'm just sad. I have to say goodbye to their good old bulldog, Jack. Might have to cross that out of some of the, uh, children's illustrated versions that we have here in the house. Uh, hymns come up quite a bit in, in, in the book. Like did what, what's Laura's relationship to hymns in terms of just, I, 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 I'm, I just think about it because hymns tend to be more theologically rich compared to the average worship song that we might encounter in a church today. Uh, any any worthwhile significance you saw in her relationship to hymns throughout her life? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so hymns actually come into the Little House books a lot, um, particularly uh, The Long Winter, which is the, the fifth book, no, oh, sixth book, I guess. Um, and uh, it's about their experience of the hard winter of 1880, 1881. And uh, sort of the hymns are sort of framing for some just really, really difficult times. And they express, uh, you know, trust in God, even in the middle of that. Um, there's a great book uh, called the Laura Ingalls Wilder, or no, the Wilder's In Ingalls Wilder Songbook. Um, probably don't want to try to buy it because it's very expensive. It's a scholarly book, uh, but it has all of the, all of the songs that are mentioned in the little house books and the actual music. So it's a, it's a large book. Um, and they're, you know, sort of separated out by, um, different types. And so all of the hymns that are mentioned and most of the hymns that are mentioned in the little house books are in, uh, the long winter. Um, uh, Laura, held on to a hymn book that they had or a song book they had when she was growing up. So she and Rose could look them up and get the lyrics when they wanted to in include lyrics in the little house books. Um, uh, some of them are, you know, about Thanksgiving. Some of them are about God's goodness. Some of them are about creation. Um, uh, so a, a number of them are about heaven. Uh, so, um, there's another author who sort of engaged uh, Laura's Christianity named uh, uh, Stephen Hines, who has several several books where he sort of takes Missouri ruralist uh, articles and combines them with uh, Bible passages. And he's he's engaged some of the um, uh, material about him. In the book. And here's kind of a, a left turn for a moment before we wrap up. Um, I, I just love to get your perspective as somebody who's spent a lot more time thinking about Laura Ingalls Wilder than the rest of us probably have. Uh, I find it curious and intriguing that all of the places that the Ingalls family tended to put their feet down for a time, there's a historic site. They we've preserved this, we've preserved that, and so uh, did did these books and the TV show just so much capture the heart of people in America that people felt this was worth preserving and tell this because it's not like you can just go to Walnut Grove or this place or that place. It's a journey. If you want to hit up all these historic sites that we've attempted to preserve, like wh why do you think that we, we have to have that physical representation? It's, it's just intriguing that there's so many places that they've tried to preserve this story. Yeah, no, th that's a great question. 
So the first uh, historical site was in Mansfield, Missouri. Um, by the time uh, Laura died in 1957, she was very famous because the Little House books were incredibly popular. Um, Little House books came out in the 30s and early 40s. So, uh, all of them sold well. Um, they then were reissued. A new edition was put out in 1953, which is the one that you may be familiar with, with the, the, the yellow binding or the blue binding with the Garth uh, Williams illustrations in them. Um, incredibly uh, good sellers, even in the 40s and 50s. So, so she was famous when she died, and immediately the people of Mansfield, um, some of the boosters and the head of the newspaper thought, we could draw people here, tourists, if we saved her house as a historic home. And so, um, so that's what they did. Uh, Rose actually paid it off. It, uh, Laura had actually, Laura and Almanzo had actually sold it in what an arrangement, what we would think of as a sort of a reverse mortgage. They sold it to a neighbor who paid them monthly to help support them um, as they aged. Rose bought the the uh, the house, gave it or the farm, gave it to the local committee, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Memorial Association, and uh, they started taking people through on tours immediately. Um, that uh, continued in the 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 sixties. Uh, some other sort of towns uh, decided that it would be great to capitalize on the, the popularity of the books. Um, it's my understanding that the real uh, popularity started coming with the TV show, though, in the 1970s. So these historic sites, um, there's one in upstate New York, where, where Omanzo grew up, and there's, as you mentioned, one in Minnesota, there's one in Wisconsin, there's uh, two in South Dakota. Um, all of these places, there's one in Kansas, the Little House in the Prairie. Um, uh, and, and even though what I've already mentioned, you know, the TV show was very much Michael Landon's vision of the past and Michael Landon's vision of uh, Laura's life and, and the West. Uh, in some ways, the, the, the TV show uh, takes issues that they were facing in the 1970s and then deals with them uh, with people who lived in the 1870s. Um, and uh, but that that really uh, continued the popularity. It gave even more popularity to the books and to people. Once again, when you read the books, it is the prose is very direct. It's like this is just what happened, and there's something about them that has made people want to go and be where those, uh, you know, where Laura was when she uh, was growing up, and where she later thought about uh, what happened to her. And in terms of uh, reader's journey with the book, takeaway, I mean, you, you take us into some unique places if, you know, in terms of if we've only read kind of the, the fictionalized stories, um, like, like what do you, how do you want to impact the reader? What do you want them to take away from their experience with this book? Sure. So, uh, I mean, it, what I always want to do for my students, uh, who, who are studying history, um, is to try to say we want to try to love our neighbor as ourself, including our neighbors who live in the past, which means trying to be as accurate as possible about who they were and what they thought. And I, we often sort of try to read things back into the past, I think, um, and we make assumptions. And uh, we need to let the people in the past be who they were and not who we want them to be. Um, and uh, so that's that's one thing. I also have just was really uh, intrigued by how Laura and Rose's collaboration uh, shaped what's in the in the Little House books in general, and then also how they um, how they treat Christianity. It turns out um, I was able to look at all of the uh, the original manuscripts, the written manuscripts that Laura wrote, and then the um, uh, the uh, there's some intermediate uh, drafts, and then the final uh, final books. Uh, Rose at times took sort of straightforward and positive descriptions of Christianity and made them more negative as far as I can tell, which might make sense in terms of somebody who had sort of rejected Christianity. But interestingly, Rose also included prayers and Bible passages and other engagements with Christianity in the book that Laura hadn't put in her original handwritten drafts. So in some ways, uh, Rose still knew scripture 
And she uh, knew or she believed that this would provide a deeper engagement with the people in the past. Um, and I think she was right. Really, both Laura and Rose combined. Um, there's, you know, scholars disagree on uh, how to understand Rose's role in uh, in the writing of Little House books. I see it as a collaboration. Um, the Little House books would not be what they are today, you know, what they ended up being if it weren't for either of those these women. And uh, so people are sort of interested in Little House books. Um, there's a there's I think I have some new things to say there about the collaboration between Laura and Rose. And uh, on the one hand, you know, when they first shop Pioneer Girl, it just it fell flat. Nobody would pick it up. Um, at the time when they repitched, reworked it, and they actually got published, like what was Rose at that time already somewhat of an accomplished novelist or author in that stage? Absolutely. Yeah. So she, um, her, her, for instance, her biographies of Hoover and, and Lindbergh came out in the 19 teens. And then she went to Europe, um, actually for the Red Cross. She was, this was right after World War One, and the Red Cross was doing projects across Europe. And so she was writing material for them to include in their magazine and their fundraising sort of um, uh, circulars. Uh, she traveled throughout Europe and, as I mentioned, to the Middle East and then was writing fiction. Uh, it was very popular in the 20s and 30s. Um, she got paid some very large amounts to publish uh, fiction in the Saturday Evening Post, which was incredibly popular at the time. Some other magazines, uh, McCall's. And uh, so uh, she was a uh, she was an old hand at getting things published. Uh, and she really helped Laura to, uh, to to get the Little House books published. Well, I think that's just an interesting distinction because one might assume, yes, she was popular because she coasted on her mother's coattails, so to speak. But she, in her own right, was an accomplished popular author long before her mother's books ever came on the scene. Yeah, and and that's interesting because she never actually wanted to be associated with her mother's book, um, because mainly because they were children's fiction. Um, she sort of saw herself as the uh, as the novelist, as the artist, um, and at times, even after Laura died, Laura uh, Rose sort of said, "My my mother just wrote what happened to her when she was growing up. Um, I she was not writing fiction. I'm the one who wrote fiction." Is sort of the implication, um, and uh, and then that, of course, you know. Uh, ironically contributes to this idea that the, the Little House books are not really works of art. They're just what happened when, in fact, they were. They were shaped by both Laura and by Rose. Uh, and, and I can say from my experience reading A Prairie Faith, m very much enjoyed it. A fascinating and engaging read. Uh, somebody gets through that book and they want to go kind of further into this more historical aspect of understanding and wrestling with Laura's life. Are there other books or resources you'd recommend alongside your book? Sure. So, um, you know, a very short book uh, is um, Laura Ingalls Wilder, A Writer's Life. Uh, the author's uh, last name is Hill, Pamela Smith Hill. Um, that's uh, so Hill is a writer. And so she was addressing this. She wrote this for the South Dakota State Historical Society. It's a small book. It's a quick read. It's uh, it's really good. Um, people are interested in sort of a longer uh, history. John Miller's book, Becoming Laura Ingalls Wilder, which came out in the 90s. Um, still really pretty good. Um, th the longest read is actually the most recent biography of Wilder before mine. Um, it's called Prairie Fires. Um, the author is Caroline Frazier. Um, if you want all of the sort of minute details uh you know fraser has all of them i don't agree with some of you know fraser's overall interpretations um but it's a wonderful book she's you know intensely researched read everything that i read and more um uh, about wilder's life and rose as well and uh i remember when pioneer girl came out that annotated edition and how insanely pop like it was hard to find sometimes uh and any thoughts on why that struck a chord? I mean, I feel like it kind of revitalized interest in Laura to some degree when that came on the scene. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's that's another one. That's excellent. It came out in 2014. The editor of that book is actually Pamela, Pamela Smith Hill. Um, that and uh, 
the notes, there's almost as many pages of notes in that book as, you know, pages of manuscript. Uh, lovingly done, lavishly illustrated. It's a big book. Um, and you're right. It just, uh, to, for, for some people who hadn't been sort of in the know about Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, that uh, sort of told, uh, you know, people were going on the radio and saying, oh, did you know, did you hear that, you know, Laura actually worked outside the home when she was a child? That wasn't another thing. She has these other um, descriptions. Uh, so, yeah, that's a super book. There's actually some several books that have come out since then um, uh, from that. It's also the South Dakota State Historical Society that they published a book called Pioneer Girl Perspectives. Uh, they published a book. About there's three different drafts that uh, Rose and Laura worked on to try to get that published, um, and uh, I think it's called the Revised Text. Uh, if you're really uh, really into it, big books, um, neat stuff. And in terms of people connecting with you, finding out more about the book, all the things, where would we best discover you on the web? Sure. So uh, best way is to go to the uh, the website for the book, which is. Faith of LIW. So just straight on out, faithofliw.com. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for Trinity Christian College as well. Their website is uh, uh, trnty.edu. So it's Trinity without the eyes, uh, trnty.edu. There's so many schools uh, named Trinity. Um, but we're at a liberal arts college in the south suburbs of Chicago. Um, we offer over 50 majors in the arts and sciences and education, business, social work, nursing. Um, we're actually doing some creative things to try to help students get out without a lot of debt. Um, we've reset our tuition and uh, we also have uh, reworked our schedule. So there's very few classes on Wednesdays. Uh, students uh, can use that to do co-op. We are really encouraging students to do co-op, which helps them reduce their tuition as well. Um, or get rest, do their homework, uh, other things to help uh, college students be well today. Um, so that's trnty.ed. And we'll make it easy like we do with every episode. We'll have links in the description and the show notes to any websites that have been mentioned, as well as links to any of the books that we've talked about throughout the episode. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with John Fry. Once again, our book today was A Prairie Faith, The Religious Life of Laura Ingalls Wilder. And John, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Sean.